Hello and welcome back to Unpopular People. We believe that listening and learning from each other is key for personal development and success. Today in our interview, Nick from Liverpool. Nick is a general manager of the Burley Heads Surf Club at the Gold Coast. You can find the show notes for this episode on our website www.unpopularpeople.com. You can also find our brand new shop on our website with clothes designed by Elisa. If you want to stay updated, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter. You can also find this on our website www.unpopularpeople.com. And now enjoy this inspiring interview with Nick. Yeah, hello Nick. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, great to have you in our show today. So, um, we know a little bit about you, but our guests don't. So, the first question we have for you is, where were you born and how did you grow up? Well, thank you and thanks for allowing me to speak today. Um, I was born in Liverpool, in England. Um, stayed there till I was around 18 traveled a little bit around America um, and then finally I had a girlfriend of them days and I we both traveled to Australia together um, where it didn't work out unfortunately when we got here so we went our separate ways but I went traveling a bit and ended up meeting my lovely wife now Natasha who's an Australian and we have four children obviously and I've been here now I think about 27 28 years Yeah, it's very exciting. I think it was a good move. So why did you decide to leave um, Liverpool at the first place? Why did you go to America? Why did you do this? Um, I think I always wanted to explore the world, you know, and see. I, I didn't want to be stuck in Liverpool. I always had an adventurous side to me. Um, when I went to America, it was working on the summer camps with the kids. And, you know, they, they all send the kids to the summer camps for three or four months. And then... Um, normally you have the opportunity then to go traveling afterwards they you know so we travel around the east coast and new orleans and you meet great people i think the first year i was there we traveled with a couple of israeli guys down um i, I bailed in new orleans they were going to california um yeah so i always had that i think a thought of living somewhere other than liverpool although i love it my family is still there i just um I guess I wanted to see the world and see what I had to offer. So let's go a little bit back to your childhood. How was it like? How did you grow up? Do you have siblings? How was your time back then? Um, I guess when you look back on it, um, it was. It, we, I felt like it was a very normal childhood compared to the estate where we live, um, which was quite a rough council area in Liverpool. And but it's only when you start reminiscing and talking to people you realize it actually was quite um unique in a way you know we all lived it was six children my mum and dad i shared the room with my three brothers um which is the way everyone lived in them days and it was it was actually it was fun you know growing up in them council estates it, it can be a bit rough but there's so many children around that when you look back There was never a dull moment, you, you know, playing football, hide and seek. It was quite a simple time. You didn't need much technology. You didn't, you'd go and wander the streets for hours or the fields picking, picking raspberries and blackberries. It was just, although it was, you didn't have many possessions, it, there was some kind of happiness and freedom about it. Money, no one seemed to have money, but you didn't really, it didn't matter because everyone was in exactly the same boat and you'd go and you'd visit an auntie if you needed a biscuit or a drink of water and it was, you know, makes me feel old when I reminisce like that, but um, it was it was quite nice. It was, you know, there was some rough times, but it was overall, I think I look back and think it was, I'm happy I grew up that way. So what did your parents do and um, uh, what did they say when you left Liverpool behind? Um, believe it or not, my dad was actually a window cleaner. So he was like, um, you know, we knew everybody and everybody knew him. I had a huge family. I think my dad had, I think, three sisters and four brothers. And my mum had eight sisters, you know. So uh, 
you know, my mum, I think she said they grow up in a two bedroomed house with nine daughters, which is quite unbelievable to think. But that was the way people lived. So um, I think they always felt like I was going to be a bit more of an adventurer than the rest of the family, you know. But th- they were sad, very sad to see me leave Liverpool. Um, but the opportunities were very small, really. You know, I, I think, you know, you don't where we are now on the Gold Coast. It, it's, it, you know, as much as my family are there and it's a beautiful to go home, you do feel very fortunate, you know, to have, have this opportunity. So um, I do miss them. And as you get older, you start wondering whether you've made the right decisions because your brothers and sisters are getting older too. But um I think it's the right decision, you know what I mean, at the moment. And um, you just said uh, we are here at the Gold Coast, that's right. Um, yeah, we know you are here in the surf club, you are the manager. Uh, how did you come to this job? And from arriving in Australia to today, what happened all the years between? <laughs> you know, my life's been a, a, an adventure, you know, right from the word go. You know, I look back and I've had such a experience and it was quite interesting because I think growing up in Liverpool you you kind of you don't always do things legally yeah, well, not illegally but you know how to push the boundaries and how to take advantage of opportunities and yeah so um I actually ended up in Australia because um I, I had a girlfriend we were living in a place in Jersey in the Channel Islands um we actually had kind of split up but we uh, we owned a car together And she phoned me one day, I still had the car, and she said, look, I want you to sell the car because I want half the money. And I said, why? And she said, oh, I'm going to Australia. So I thought, well, that might be a good opportunity to come over. So we kind of got back together, came to Australia. But I actually I didn't have a visa to be here because a friend of mine had told me that you didn't need a visa to just turn up in Australia. This is 30 years ago. You could get jobs anywhere. It was never a problem. You didn't find a tax file number, which was not really true. I found when I got here, you actually did need all them things. So I kind of knew a guy. I, I turned up at Manly in New South, in Sydney way. And a guy who I knew from Jersey was just leaving the week later. So he, And his name was Ian Lord. And he actually... Um, said to me why don't you use my name and tax file number and you can get a job so the first job i got was in a a place in in manly but i used this guy's name and number so i was working in a big harbour diggers a big establishment and everyone was calling me ian for like three months which was really really difficult but you know so i just i just kept going for a while and then in the end i think the next job i thought i can't keep this up it's just uh, people were thinking i was like ignoring them all the time when they were saying ian and i wasn't answering them so um so yeah i just ended up staying in australia moving around moved up to the gold coast worked in various jobs and then And when I got to the Gold Coast, I met my now wife. I was working in the um, casino under my real name this time, you know, so I could, could be called Nick, so it was easier. And then, um, like, eventually the immigration did catch up with me, and I actually got deported when I was when I was fa when I was first here. So um, it wasn't it wasn't bad. The, I was living with some Irish fellas in a place in Surfers. And they actually immigration raided the place. I I escaped <laughs> like a crim. I've I've done a runner and I ran and I ran to my. I was running with the immigration guys behind me, and I was heading towards my now wife's place. So I actually I kind of hid out in her place for about a week, and then eventually I turned myself in. And it it wasn't too bad because I still actually had a visa to be in the country. I just didn't have a work permit, so they did tell me I had to go home. But they um it wasn't I, even though I was deported they let me have a week to say goodbye to everyone and I booked the flight and they met me at the airport and so yeah so exciting that was only one part there yeah so was you got to the airport and then you flew back and and what made you like I mean your wife obviously made you come back but what happened well so it was interesting because I think at the time I was 
kind of I'd only just met my wife we were like girlfriend and boyfriend you know what I mean and and we got to the airport and the immigration were there because they had my passport so they were handing it back to me to make sure I got on the flight and and everything so um Tash uh, said to me oh look I'm I'll I'm going to come over to the UK to Jersey to see her and I actually didn't think I'd ever see her again I don't know why I just thought that's something what people say when they you know in that situation I'll see you and then I remember I got back to Jersey got my old job back and all that and then um, and I think she phoned me and um and said I've booked a flight to come and I remember thinking I think I said to one of my friends I said there's some Australian girl coming over I said I don't even know her that well but she's coming over to see me and I look back now and like you know I think I actually and I think to, when I talked to Tash now obviously she was looking for an adventure as well so she said I didn't really know you either but she just wanted an excuse to go <laughs> go traveling so fortunately you know we we stuck together and done yeah and done the travel thing and that yeah yeah we love I would say <laughs> amazing <laughs> how did you come back to Australia then and when so my now wife um she got a two-year visa you know for work permit for the UK and that so we we basically I say I was living in in the Channel Islands in Jersey and we worked there for a year saved off some money um and then we kind of went back to Liverpool went to Greece went around Europe went back to jersey and um and she got pregnant so um we kind of had to make a decision do we live in jersey or the uk or do i apply for residency you know for australia and um you know it, even though it is beautiful here it was it was also jersey the channel islands was a beautiful place as well so we we'll, it wasn't sure where we were going to live but we decided i may as well apply for to you know to come in for residency and i wasn't sure because of the deportation i thought how is that going to work are they going to let me back in but i think because they had records of me and tash being together before that you know so basically i had i applied for residency and it was quite easy in them days you know we went through a de facto relationship and and yeah and then we just um came back to australia and then um, started a, a new adventure from then you know together yeah and what was your profession or wh what did you do back then when you um first you said you worked in a factory or something in in sydney and uh what what did you then do when you come back to australia with your wife <laughs> or now wife well i think the the opportunities here i think if you work hard are huge you know and i think um if you've got a bit of a personality and you can uh, you know you can talk to people and that so i basically um i was always in the hospitality industry like so i um got back into hospitality i think i got a job in a a big golf course initially um a big brand new golf course which is just opened on the gold coast and then i got an opportunity to manage a, a golf course which was quite for me was really exciting you know because i was from liverpool from a council estate you know and, and and suddenly i was managing a huge golf course in on the gold coast and i was like and i think i i kind of always doubted if i was capable of doing it you know so as an the only way i could ever feel like i had to justify my position was by working so many hours so i would i would always just because I'm quite unorganized at times, so it, I'd, I'd make up for my unorganization by being there most of the time. So, um, but but I was I, f I always felt I think even now I always feel very fortunate to to have these jobs, you know, because I think. But I'm starting as I get older now. I'm starting to realize. I'm starting to feel like, hey, I deserve it. You know, I do deserve. I, I'm I'm good at what I do. But I think I've always coming up through that council estate working class you always think you're not really good enough and and it's only been the last few years you think no i actually do know what i'm doing i've, I've managed places i've done had great results i've made plenty of money and i'm starting to maybe believe in myself and getting a bit more comfortable with who i am a bit you know so yeah yeah very great story and um Do you have any recommendations? You said you learned to be more confident for people that are not confident. How can they become more confident? Look, I think, I think if you're always, you know, as I've got older, I think, 
if you're a good person, you know, and you do the right thing and, and you've got a good heart. I know it sounds, I mean, you know, for me, saying these things sounds, it's something when in my teenage years, I never thought I'd be sitting here saying things like this. But I think, you know, even when I hire people now, you know, we, we, we probably have 70 staff in this place and that. And I, I really always have this philosophy where I think, you know, you can... You can teach people to do a job, but you can't teach someone to be a good person. I think that's something you you are or you're not a good person. And I think, you know, unfortunately, sometimes life can overlook good people too, you know, because people, you know, false people can put themselves forward and they can get plenty of rewards. But I think, I think just by being kind-natured um, and I think not worrying what other people think I think as long as you're true to yourself and believe in what you're doing is the right thing I think the younger generation now I've got you know four children and and I really worry that they're so influenced by what other people think of them and it's a worrying time for I think the younger generation because it's lovely when you see a young confident person who's a little bit unique and they don't follow the crowd just to fit in but at the same token, we all know when you're teenagers, it's it's so hard not to fit in. You know, it's so easy just to be part of the crowd. And, you know, if, you, if you're in that, you know, being, I guess, isolated. Um, but I think as you get older, it's easy when you're older to, to say what you do. But when you're younger, it's a completely different ball game. You know, you don't think, your mind doesn't think, you want to, you don't want to stand out in the crowd. You don't want to be unique. Sometimes you you want to just be cool and one of the one of the gangs. So, but I think from my point of view, I, I look for people who just have a good heart and treat people with dignity and respect. Really, yeah. So I think um, not standing out from the crowd uh, must be a bit hard for your four kids because they have like very interesting names, as we once heard. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the uh, names of your kids, if you like, and why you chose them. Well, my, my first son, um, he was born on John Lennon's birthday. So I'm from Liverpool and, you know, so the Beatles were obviously a huge influence. So my mum and my wife's a bit of a hippie, you know, she she's a bit unique and I think she'd like to spend her life just traveling around in a car van living in a commune i think that's you know she's quite a she's a beautiful person but um so my mum kind of thought like you've got to call him john and i thought that ain't gonna work with tash you know she ain't gonna she's not gonna go so we come up with the name kaya z k-i-a z-double-e and then i was a big bob dylan fan yeah, i love my music i, I still do I, I go to sleep at night listening to music and and because of the john lennon's birthday we got lennon so we called him kaya z Dylan Lennon Corby Owens which is Tasha's surname and my surname because we weren't married at the time when we had our first son so we just called him Corby Owens and then my second boy came along which again was unique but we called him Zebedee which was my oldest brother had a nickname called Zeb and we just we just kind of went on it so Zebedee Denim who was an actor I think Tash liked some old actor called Denim Elliott and bros was natasha's grandfather so zebedee denim bros owens for the surname which is again weird and then lulu my only daughter her name i don't know where we came up but we called her lulu texas queenie bell and there is a story somewhere i think tash had a doll or something so um so and then the youngest actually the youngest guy um, I don't think you guys have met, maybe not yet. So yeah, so he um, there's a famous poet in Australia called Banjo Patterson, who wrote, you know. So we called him Banjo Gulliver Fox Owens. So and that one actually surprised the people back home more than anything because I, I, in Australia the, the the name Banjo is kind of you hear it now and then because this famous poet and you know. But obviously, when I told my mum she's just thinking it's the instrument the banjo so you know she thought i'd name my son after a, a, like calling them calling them guitar or saxophone but you know but there's a famous po there's a famous poet he wrote a poem called the man from snowy river which is a really famous aussie so it, it, as much as when we go back to england or the uk 
they see banjo they go why but in australia it's not quite as there uh, but uh, i'll say with the funny thing i was down in the the bar down or the kiosk downstairs the other week and i was talking about the kids names and i got talking about my my pets and i got a dog called harry and a cat called emily and it was so weird and the person said to me geez they said you've got all these strange names for your for your kids and you've got a dog and you've got really normal names for the pets you know what i mean <laughs> and i thought and i thought you know but there's a saying when the, when they say you take you can take the mickey which means make fun you know like so i i think i said to, i said you, you you can take the mickey out of your kids but you can't do that to your animals you can't do that <laughs> yeah. So we got Harry and Emily for a dog and a cat, which is really is strange, actually. Yeah. That builds some confidence also with the kids, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> so you said uh, your passion is music. What kind of music do you listen to? I still love Bob Dylan, believe it or not, you know, and the Beatles. I, I, I tend to be, you know, I do like some modern music, but I, I do tend to be a bit old-fashioned with all this Crosby, Stills and Nash and, you know, I, I, but... And, you know, we do a lot of folk festivals in Australia. So Tash, the Woodford Folk Festival, which is not on, unfortunately, this year because we've been to it. My wife goes, like, you know, for the whole trip. But because it's so busy, it goes for about eight days. I'm, it's Christmas time, so I end up just going up and down. And I'm working here because it's <laughs> crazy at the surf club that time of year. But it's just the music festivals. We try and follow a lot of the folk music festivals and there's some great in australia you know you camp the weather's amazing you just you can camp there's bellingen there's all kinds of mull and bimby has a great festival you know there's some fantastic festivals so yeah play a little bit of guitar a bit of singing um not i'd like to play the guitar more you know but i think it's interesting uh, before i ended up getting into management i was really practicing and practicing but i think the job And the children, it really put my guitar, you know, I, I'm kind of still at the same level I was 27 years ago, you know, because I I, I pick it up and my fingers are killing me because I haven't played for a few months and that. So, um, but yeah, I love my, love my, my f bit of folk music. Yeah. yeah. And a bit of chanting, a bit of kirtan with the meditation. I love all that too. Yeah. Nice, yeah, thank you very much. And um, we also um, heard like many times now the surf club and you mentioned it um, before that you go down to the kiosk to the surf club. And so how did you end up here? Like what happened uh, from the from the golf club to the surf club in Burley Heads? Do you know what? I think we were sort of talking earlier about it was I was working at a, um, a, pri a good golf course, Emerald Lakes, just down the road here. And then um, it was a... a a big job you know it was a hard job but they were a huge development company and they were opening a huge development and opening a lot of restaurants um and i got an opportunity that if i was i was to open a lot of the restaurants on the new development for them and get them up and running and get an opportunity to take one of the restaurants for myself as a lease and i always wanted to own my own business and um and it was interesting because i was I took over this, the first restaurant called Cafe Belago, and it was going crazy, busy. I, I had a lot of people on the estate who I knew, so I was getting a lot of support. And, and um, But I was working hard because I was thinking it was my own business, and the kids were still fairly young, and I was probably doing 70, 80 hours a week trying to build this business up for myself. And I'm thinking, this is, this is going to be mine one day, and I'm going to be... And, and um you know it was just one day they had fantastic bathrooms we had these really posh bathrooms in this place and a young girl came out to me and said nick someone's threw up in the bathroom and i went which one she said every one every cubicle so someone had had thrown up in all all the cubicle and and i was and i I had a bucket, a mop bucket, and I'm mopping up this you know this and i and I just suddenly dawned on me i thought what am I doing? I thought this is, I, I, my children are little. If I take my own business, I'm going to be working 90 hours a week. I'm going to be doing this every night rather than pay a cleaner. I'd probably do it myself to save money. And I, and I actually just looked at the newspaper. I'd been at, with this company about 14 years. I looked in the newspaper and a, a little ad in the paper just said the Burley Surf Club is looking for a general manager. And I just thought, you know what, it might be, time for a change and when i came i think barely heads where we are i just looked at the position and the location and i knew 
we had plans to develop the safe club it wasn't quite as you know even though we're still developing now but i thought to myself i could just see huge potential here i just thought barely it, it seemed like it seemed like one of the best spots in the world you know i i i've traveled quite a bit and and even now sometimes i grab a coffee sit on the balcony i look i take a picture and send it back to liverpool <laughs> put it on facebook because it really is I, I, it could it could be as good as it gets really here. So um, yeah, and so, and with the development, I just thought to myself, if you're going to be in management, y- you want to have a job which which works. You know, you are, like you can yeah. So and then and then obviously I employed all my children. It was a good opportunity to give all them a job too. So and you know it, w- it was it was easy going. It was a bit more laid back. I, I like the fact that it was. It wasn't quite as strict. The golf course was a little bit more, a bit of fine dining, and it was very much relaxed. Yeah. So, um, and that was twelve and a half years ago now. Long time. Yeah. So, um, living in a in a club here, or uh, well, not living in the club, but um, having four children and managing the club and doing all those things, and also being surrounded by, um, you know, like, a, let's say, a drinking culture and people partying and stuff. How do you stay like fit and healthy and active? How how do you build up your day? Look, I, I'm fortunate. Like, I cycle to work most days. You know, um, and my garden. I live on. I've got an acre. Um, about 10 minutes away and it's it's the craziest hill where I've got this garden you just have to come around we'd have to come around one day and see my garden it's, it's quite but I'm on this hill and it really I, I'm obsessed with garden I've become it, it's become I always loved it even in the small houses we had trying to because you could grow so many things which you couldn't grow <laughs> in england so you know you get rock melons and watermelons and mangoes and all these tropical you know things and i've got peaches and nectar and so i've i've got an acre but it's on a hill so every spare moment i'm actually digging i'm trying to go pure organic i'm i'm just i realize now the soil of you you know it you don't need to fertilizers or anything because if your soil's right that the orga- organisms which come in it will add all that fertilizer so the worms the nematodes it, once your soil is healthy it self fertilizes and it because it's it's your plants the results you see are just phenomenal and it's almost to an extent where i, I just i read i think about god and i wake up in the morning thinking about growing <laughs> growing things and i have to be careful because i've got this place to run and there's like there's all this development and now we're coming into christmas but and and i really um I, i'm finding it hard to focus on my job because i've got this obsession with with gardening you know so but the fitness side of things sometimes the weather here and it's getting hotter now at the moment really hot so you spend four or five hours digging in a garden and you get as fit as you could ever imagine it's really quite amazing so but i do i do um i i think you i'm very conscious as a manager not to get sucked into the the culture i think the hospitality industry especially in management can really eat people up in a way you see them it's always you get invited to lunches sportsmen's lunches and i actually i say no to 90 95 percent of the invites because the thought of just sitting there in an afternoon drinking it doesn't really tick the boxes for me it has to be something to you know to entice me like i think I got a great invite a few years ago to go to the Australian Open. That was beautiful. You know, you, it was a great experience watching the tennis centre court. But I think just when you see the people here, just kind of, I guess, yeah, you, you, it is the industry we're in, and we're trying to drive that in, and we're trying to create, you know, make money like every business does. But somehow you've got a fine line between not letting it get out of control and i think because barely heads where we are has become so popular it's getting harder to control that because especially our beach bar downstairs is getting busier and busier and busier and i'm i'm not quite sure i think we might just have to change our offering and change the way we do things and maybe aim for a different demographic maybe but it's a tough one because we are a business and 
revenue is what's driving us i guess yeah yeah you said it's uh, difficult sometimes to to plan or things come up like uh, you don't know how it develops so if there happens something you have never thought about that overwhelms you um, for you planned your day and sometimes happens something how um, can you handle this situation to so do you have a tool for yourself how to get back uh, into the routine or into solving this problem you know I, i'll be honest it, it's something what i i do struggle with and you know i guess um stress and pressure and anxiety and, and it's interesting because when i talk to people people think i'd be the least anxious person in the whole world and it's amazing people think i'm so easy going and you know and nothing ever worries me but i you know when things go wrong i i do i take it takes a few days to get over them you you wake up in the middle of the night thinking about you know staff problems and what's happening you know and even i guess my biggest challenge is that having to make changes because i, I look i i am it's only my opinion but I, i feel i'm a quite a decent person and to make them the changes i know i have to make for the benefit of the business but i know they're going to affect people and even at the moment i know i have to make changes to staff in certain areas and and i know it's going to be really difficult for them particular staff people and i put it off and I, i it's it's a weakness in my management i think it's it's a positive thing because it shows i'm actually quite a human being and i, I you know i but i don't i have no pleasure in being in charge or being the boss or like look at me and i can do this i i i, I really i really struggle and i think to an extent where sometimes i think it'd be easier not being in charge because i know i i've going to have to talk to people in certain roles and because our place is developing and food trends change and offerings and people you know that people get complacent in their roles and you really need to change them and bring new people in but by doing that you really upset the people who've worked so hard for all them years and and i, I don't know i i think i have an ability to to say it's just a job you know it is and you'll always be okay i think if you have a roof over your head and you have enough food in the fridge that if things got really really bad you can just walk away and go you know i'll start again somewhere and i think you know i've got a network of good friends and family and even in the uk i, I know i think because of how i've been in my life I've got enough people if I was ever needing assistance I could lean on them and I think that's probably you get the benefit of that um but it's a very difficult industry because you know we had a a big lunch the other day and you know the chef hadn't cooked all the steaks were cooked the wrong way and and the next minute you've got like you know 80 fellas trying to complain and and, and it if physically takes its toll on you you wake up the next day and it's amazing how that how mental strain can have a, what i've learned as i've got older is it it what it does to me from a physical point of view when i'm when i'm feeling positive my energy levels are huge i, I feel like i can achieve anything but when i'm stressed or anxious it's the total opposite i'm just i feel weak i feel <laughs> like i can't deal with and i feel like i can't deal with things but I, I don't know I, I think some people can thrive on that but I think for me I I think in some ways by being a bit kind you can also get t took advantage of by by staff to be honest you know drinking too much not doing the right thing and it's a fine line between how do you how do you stay fair and try and treat everyone in with respect and get them to do the same back it, it's it it doesn't always work um so you've just got to hope that you believe in what you're doing and and it, it will work in the end yeah true thank you very much and um so another question um uh, when you uh, you got departed once uh, <laughs> i guess you're an australian citizen now but imagine you would be like or get departed again uh which country would you choose to live in like where would you go do you know what i have a 
me and my wife and the kids we've had a fantastic um time traveling through asia and you know we've been some of the remotest places in sumatra sri lanka she's obsessed with tea so she's got her own tea business so we went visit visited a lot of the tea making facilities but i think i would go somewhere i would actually go somewhere like sri lanka or cambodia because i think i like the people i like the culture where people don't need i think there's not much greed there there's a lot of family share and everyone seems to look out for each other india is an amazing place i mean I guess I romanticize it a bit without living there. <laughs> you know, I feel like it might be fantastic and maybe after a few years I might see a different side to the people. But I think also from a financial point of view, it would be because the property is so expensive here, you could you could probably sell up and and live like a king. I often think when I've traveled to like Indonesia and Sri Lanka, it seems like, you know, you can, for a couple of dollars, you can you can have a fantastic feast and accommodations five or six dollars a day so i think i would probably head for asia i think yeah i think that'd be my choice yeah yeah, yeah cool um now the other way around um you know our uh, podcast name is unpopular people so imagine you would be popular so not being deported being popular all over the world you had influence what would you do differently or what would you do with your power or your influence do you know it might sound like i'm trying to sound too nice but i'd, I'd i would love to sh help poor people i'd love to set up an orphanage and and even you know uh, we support some orphanages in india and you know i'd love to actually open one with with in my mum's name my mum back home is like one of the most kind generous people i've ever met and i'd love to do something i'd love to have let her tell people about her generosity and her kindness i think I mean, I still have the, you know, because I'm a singer, I often, I still have my dreams of being like a rock star. I think if I could, you know, I, I mean, obviously, you know, it, I think I always look back and think, you know, if you could do anything in life, I did love my football because I'm from Liverpool, though playing for Liverpool would have been, or being like a famous singer and living that lifestyle. But I think, I, I, I yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think I would have found it hard to, I do believe, I know it's easier said than done though, but if you had all that money and you were so popular and you had, I think I think the only satisfaction you could get would by, be helping people, I'm sure. You know what I mean? You know, you'd, you'd want to have a good life. We all love, I'd love to have a big Tesla and drive around and, you know, a big, a great big swimming pool. I think, I wouldn't like to think I was too good, uh, too nice, that I wouldn't want to enjoy all the good things in life either, but I'd definitely... I'd like to I'd like to share the wealth and and you know help people somehow help people and people who need it because I think in the western world there's not really much poverty you know when you go to these other countries you see people and, and like you know twenty dollars thirty dollars can really make a difference like you know you you give that to a kid in England or it it doesn't mean nothing because they got they've got so much but yeah I think I'd like to I'd like to try and do something and help as many people as possible. It sounds crazy, but it sounds like, you know, too nice. Uh, yeah. Doesn't sound crazy at all to me. But um, what I also, um, what I'm also wondering is how do you set your goals? Um, especially now we're recording this in, by the end of November in 2020 and the world has changed like dramatically. How do you set your goals now, nowadays? You know, I think to myself, as I say, when I look back and I grew up, you know, a council house, my mum still lives in the, the council house I was born in. And I, I, I'm in such a, a financial situation, like, you know, we, we have this house, which, you know, I, I kind of, even if I won $50 million dollars tomorrow, I think I'd stay in the house. I love it that much. You know, it's such a, I just, we look out onto the hills. It's close to the beach. It's just like, and I've tried to plant every possible tree, well, every tropical tree I can find, you know what I mean? So, and like, even we have an investment property in Burley, which it, it, I, I find it hard to imagine that I'm a kid from Liverpool 
I didn't think I'd have so much in life. You know, I've got cars, I've got mountain bikes. Or, you know, I, I, I actually, I'm already, I think I'm ahead of where I I thought I would be. You know, I, I'm actually, you know, I, I look back and I think to myself, I remember coming to Australia and my wife's parents had two new cars and a big house and we were staying with them. And I think I said to the dad, I said, I could never see a time. I could never foresee a time where I had my own house and a couple of nice cars because growing up in Liverpool, you, you, were, you were kind of made to always think of yourself as working class, rent a house, just work, 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 work. And, and, and I couldn't see a time. Where, and what I've got now, I think to myself, I d- I, I, it just amazes me. I, you know, I, I've I've ate, I've ate the best food. I've I've I, I love my red wine. You know, and I've drank the best red wines. I've, you know, I've I've just lived a life. I, I seem to have like, I I just feel so lucky. I I just feel so so lucky. And I think to myself, you know, I I don't really want for anything. And I think that's why I keep thinking, I have to start doing something for people because you know I. I it can't be fair in life that I mean I have worked hard you know and, and I, I and I've been a decent person most of the time <laughs> when I'm not getting deported and that you know but um, but I just I, I don't know I think with my upbringing and quite a rough working class upbringing to, to sit here now and to manage a place like this in an amazing spot and to live in a house and and have another house and it just seems like I think to myself I mean which is I'm not rich by any means it's only you know it's a lot of people live this way but I just think I just think I've got more than I ever thought I'd have at this point in my life yeah so yeah I'm I'm on track for <laughs> Yeah, maybe I can even retire early, you know. It's like, yeah, yeah it, I think it, uh, it's such a great mindset to be so thankful and that many people can learn this from you. I think it's a, it's a great thing. Um, yeah, I would like to come back that you would love to do more for other people. And we wondering sometimes or ask the question, what would you do if you would have a school full of people that you want to teach something for young uh, children or for people who grow up uh, for yeah for, for students for adolescents what uh, would you like to teach them they ca- can't learn in a normal school um yeah that's an interesting question i, I think i think to be uh, you know Like I say, I, I always look back and I think I would love to do that. I think that would give me satisfaction to try and, you know, y- y- you read these days about all the bullying and how people look at children and they judge them on how they look and if they're slim and if they've got, you know, big lips and makeup. And and I look at the kids who are um, sort of less fortunate and, and I think to myself, how can you make, how could you make every child feel special and feel happy with who they are and i don't i haven't got the answers and my wife has got a better philosophy philosophy than me because she believes you know you you're not your body you're just your your spirit and but i i think i'd try and my children i'm so fortunate that they they look at other children um like my youngest boy a lot of his friends are like say autistic or they they like the odd kids in a way but he doesn't look at them like that they're just his friends and and I think in some ways he's much my children are much better than I was when I was young because I was I did want to be a bit of the cool kid and I was a good footballer and and I think there was children in my school who I look back now and I really wish I could have befriended them it was such a rough school and I remember there was a I think it was a kid, a, a Pakistani kid, and and he used to spend most of his time just getting beat up. You know, I never used to beat do it myself. And we had a a deaf a unit there with the deaf kids, and they got like tormented and picked on. And I I wasn't as much as I deep down inside me I thought I wish I could do something here. I didn't have the strength to stand out in the crowd. I just didn't have the 
the strength in me and I, I'd love to have been strong enough and I think I could have done it I could have said hey guys don't don't do this you know what I mean like and I, I look back and it's a huge regret and I look at my children and they would have stood up you know and and um, I, I'd, so if I had a school and I had I had that opportunity I would I would definitely want people to look at everyone as if they were special and and they were all or no one was better than each other you know I think because I see kids now and you look at the ones who don't fit in and I guess there's you know maybe there's a suicidal problem with people you know with all the trying to be popular and things like that and I, I think if somehow you could say to you could get that message across that hey you can be popular whoever you are and I, I think it, it has helped with like say in some ways with the computer generation has helped in a way because the nerds used to be picked on but sometimes the nerds now can be the coolest kids and you know because they they don't have to be the most sportiest the most best looking person to be popular which is a step in the right direction i guess but there's still a lot of um discrimination against you know if, if a kid's overweight if a kid's you know uh, and i don't know i don't I, I wish that didn't exist because i think it I think there must be kids and I was fortunate to have a lot of friends and I'd go out at night and we'd all play and we'd have a great laugh and there must have been children who just went home from school and sat alone and I, I you know I, I, I wish I could turn back the clock and spend time with some of them people and bring them into you know and, and being strong but I, I wasn't you know I, I, I feel like I'm a better person now but I just didn't have that maturity or strength to to stand out in the crowd myself because i knew it would have meant putting my neck on the line and and maybe i would have become picked on and i think i just wasn't strong enough to do it but i really regret i look back now and i think you know i was just like a sheep going along with everyone and i wish i could have looked back in my life and gone geez i i stood up for what i believed in there you know and yeah so but i have to say like this regret maybe that you have now um and also like the um when you say like oh you wish you could turn back the time i think you kind of did because now you bring up um, four kids or you brought up four kids uh, with this mentality and with this kind of mindset so um and even if you probably didn't do it back then but it's the past you can't change it anymore but uh, you're doing it now and you already said that your kids um, they would stand up for for this kid so yeah you're doing your part so this is this is great um, I have two more questions <laughs> so um, one question I, I think is very interesting especially uh, now in this time we're living um, if someone if it's a young person or um, in your age or whatever yeah um, you're a young person too <laughs> but um, it's not what I wanted to say um, if you get hold of let's say 20,000 um, Australian dollars um, they just fall into your hands like for legal in a legal way <laughs> what would you um what you would you suggest uh, should they do with this money should they invest it should they like what do, should they do with twenty thousand dollars you know it's interesting my my son my oldest boy he was luckily enough to um buy a lot of cryptocurrency you know you just, yeah, and and he and i i think you know he, he bought like the bitcoins when they were low and i think he's got you know three or four bitcoins and a few cryptos and all that um at the moment if it was <laughs> i'm i'm still a little bit sensible where i would say like you know if you could save up for a deposit somehow on a house you know it, it, or a unit or something it my wife would say the complete opposite she'd say go and spend it and go to a festival and and listen to the best music and 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 i'm starting to actually lean over to her way of thinking where i think you know maybe you shouldn't worry about the future and live in the moment and i'm but i think i would still say when you're young if you set yourself up and you said you know let's i mean us twenty thousand. i don't know what i'd do for you in australian property but maybe in the country town you could that'd be enough for a deposit in like my wife from a little town called alra and you can pick up a house there for like hundred and seventy thousand dollars. so you know you you could get a bit more together and just get a little rental and i think the type of if you were from my experience we bought our first house in burley and it, 
it, I think it was one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and it was just it, property just seems to go insane, and every, everyone's made so much money on pro. You know, just look, I guess. So I'd say twenty grand. I would say maybe either the cryptocurrency or a house, but maybe ask me in another year i'd say just go to a festival and and live for the moment and and you know i maybe give a small maybe you know maybe donate a little bit you know it's not it's not that much money so you're not rich with 20 grand you probably want to do something sensible with it but um you know if you're a younger generation i think you wouldn't want to waste it. You'd probably invest it in some way. Yeah. And also, like uh, my last question then for today um, is, what happened to Ian, the guy that you got the text file number from? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ian Lord, his name was. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. He probably he probably might have got money from my tax return because I think you get your tax <laughs> return and it was and it was all in his name. So he probably got he probably got it. He probably ended up making about. 20,000 from me that year because all the tax because when you're on your visa you get your tax back so it, no so we even though he probably pretended he was being nice but he probably had a double double reason for letting me use his tax file number for a whole year <laughs> yeah. i should find if i ever find him he probably owes me fifteen thousand dollars <laughs> yeah, yeah. but uh, it was still it was hard going with the name though my ian lord it was a tough it was a tough tough few months trying to live to two different worlds you know what i mean eh? so no he was okay i think yeah thank you so much i think uh we're coming to an end now um because of time reasons we are all busy um yeah we thank you very much for your time today it was so inspiring and we learned a lot i think the listeners learned a lot is there anything or a, a website i don't know where people can find out more about you oh not really i'm on facebook and things like that and um, now I, i guess you know the Burley head surf club i'm always here i'm the manager down here if, if anyone's in australia <laughs> or, you know it's definitely worth checking out um But now, I, I, you know, I'd love to hear. I always, I love talking to people. You know, I love meeting new people. I think that's the great thing about being in this industry that you do get the opportunity to meet people like yourselves and share some experiences and just get to know what's going on in the world. But now, just call me here or email the Safe Club, hey, eh? manager at barely .com .au. Um Always happy to answer some questions or send you some beautiful pictures of Bailey heads. See you now. Yeah, thank you very much. We will add this all to the show notes. And um, yeah, we'll wrap this up for today. If there are any final words from your side, it's now the time for it. Now, just uh, thank you for the time, you know, and it was lovely to open up. And, you know, I'm at that stage in my life where it's nice to tell, it's nice people to ask you a few questions. So, um, yeah, it's lovely to talk to you guys. And good luck with whatever you guys do in the future. Hey, good luck. See ya. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you for listening to this very interesting interview today with uh, Nick and we hope you enjoyed the show. Um, you can find out more about us on www.unpopularpeople.com. You can also find the show notes on our website. If you have any questions, shoot us a message. Same on www.unpopularpeople.com. We love to hear from you. Thank you and goodbye.